Susan, were you able to send out the uh, PDF beforehand? Hi, Susan and Jimmy. John, can you hear me okay? Yes. Hi, Jeff. Yep, we can hear you. Great, thank you. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's lecture on new frontiers in clinical space medicine. Before introducing today's speaker, I want to remind you that tomorrow at 5 p.m., in room 301A of the Cullen Building, there is a Space Medicine Pathway and Research Info Session hosted by our center and the Space Medicine Interest Group. You should have received an email yesterday from Susan Ressler that provided details about the event, and Jimmy Wu and I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jonathan Clark, who's a BCM faculty member in the Department of Neurology and Center for Space Medicine. Dr. Clark really has had an amazing career. He's board certified in neurology and aerospace medicine, is a fellow of the Aerospace Medical Association and former president of the Space Medicine Association. He served 26 years on active duty with the US Navy and qualified as a Naval Flight Officer, Naval Flight Surgeon, Navy Diver, US Army Parachutist, and Special Forces Military Freefall Parachutist. He flew combat medical evacuation missions in Operation Desert Storm with the Marine Corps, and I truly want to thank him for his service to our nation. Importantly, Dr. Clark was also a NASA flight surgeon and chief of the medical operations branch at NASA, as well as the senior FAA aeromedical examiner. <laughs> so he's held a number of important leadership positions, including those 
with the National Space Biomedical Research Institute, Excalibur Almaz, Inspiration Mars, Red Bull Stratus, and the Stratex Space Dive Project. He's a space medicine consultant for commercial space companies, including Virgin Galactic, SpaceX, and Space Perspective. And I've only given you some of John's amazing accomplishments. Basically, uh, Dr. Clark is the go-to guy on all things neurological and extreme environments. And he's an expert in crew resilience and crew survival in space. It's therefore an honor to have Dr. Clark as part of the Center for Space Medicine. He's a fabulous lecturer, and uh, we look forward to his talk today. Thanks, John, for agreeing to carve out some time in your schedule to teach us new things. I learn new information every time I, I hear you speak. So thanks for agreeing to do this. Okay, so I'll hit share now. Mm -hmm. Can you guys hear me? Yep. I have Susan here <laughs> helping this little monkey push the right buttons. Oh, yeah, that's right. Oh, you're sharing screen. Okay. okay. So you just need to present. Okay. Uh, this button. Right. Mm -hmm. Hey, well, uh, we'll get going here because as usual, I have way too many slides. So thank you all for your uh, your attention. Um, we're going to go, uh, I'm going to talk on just some uh, cool things that are going on. Uh, some of it's historical and uh, has involved uh, Baylor College of Medicine students and residents. And uh, just kind of like this is just a, a snippet of what's actually going on. Um, here's my uh, disclosure information. I work for a lot of different companies. Most of my work now is with three companies, Space Perspectives, Operator Solution, and uh, JAG Human Performance, and also the Foundation for Aerospace Safety and Training. I have no conflicts of interest. Uh, these are the uh, learning objectives. I'm going to talk a little bit about space medicine as a practicing space medicine person. Um, and then uh, talk a little bit about extreme environments and our, the human's ability to adapt, the importance of understanding as we have become technologically very complicated, complex, that it's the human machine uh, mission interface uh, that is really crucial, understanding how we uh, interact with all these advanced technologies. And then I'll talk a little bit about um, analog environments as they uh, play a huge role in, in our progress. So space medicine actually as a, as a discipline was first coined in 1948. It's a multidisciplinary specialist specialty. It's not just physicians. Uh, it's, it's virtually anybody that's involved in the human aspect of uh, space exploration. It currently has a board specialty uh, under aerospace medicine. It's not specifically space medicine, aerospace medicine includes aviation and space medicine, which I've been blessed to be able to have done both. Um, but the, the cool thing that's going on now is the American Board of Emergency Medicine is now uh, in the process of developing fellowship programs as an alternate pathway to, to be space medicine uh, you know, uh, certified. Uh, these are just some of the uh, uh, original um, articles that came out in uh, space medicine in the late 40s and early 50s. Remember, this is just after World War II. And um, other than sending a few animals up on V-2 rockets out at uh, White Sands, we really didn't have much experience back then. Um, and we heavily go back and look at uh, these different uh, topics. And uh, I'm very interested in crew survival and escape. And one of the uh, authors here, Fritz Haber, talked about escape and survival at high altitude. Uh, so we really do stand on the shoulders of giants. Like I said, it's a multidisciplinary specialty. Uh, as you can see here, uh, we have to interface extensively with engineers. And so, uh, especially in life support and human factors systems engineering. Um, and so that's one of the things we really have to spend a lot of uh, uh, time on is understanding engineer speak. Um, what's an extreme environment? Basically, it's an environment where there's uh, an, uh, an a deficiency or excess of certain stressors um, that include uh, a variety of physical uh, com components that might be uh, thermal energy, uh, oxygen or gas composition, atmospheric pressure or uh, hydrostatic pressure in the case of diving uh, training uh, and changes in gravity, both high and low. Um, what's amazing is that humans have the ability to uh, um, endure almost the un impossible. There's uh, actual humans have gone as deep uh, in pressure as over 2,200 feet. 
Um, and obviously they've gone in very high altitudes, obviously protected as we'll get into a little bit later. Um, some of the concerns in this, the biology of survival is that humans uh, don't always have the ability to uh, adequately um, anticipate threats, uh, either because the uh, uh, agent very rapidly incapacitates or does so in a very slow, insidious manner. If any of you ever had hypoxia training, you can uh, see how incredibly um, um, difficult it is to detect that. Um, so because of various, uh, because of our evolutionary past over the 100,000 uh, years or so we've been around as a subspecies or as a species, um, we have adapted to, uh, we've had to adapt to new things as we've developed these advanced technologies. And uh, we'll, we'll get into some of this a little bit later. So the critical variables for human survival are uh, broken down into categories. One is the physics of the environment. The other is the physiologic limits, you know, that how, how much uh, uh, oxygen we can carry and saturate, um, uh, how much muscle endurance we can have, various kinds of parameters like that. Um, the exposure and the rate of change from the, not, the, the, the normal terrestrial environment to the um, uh, extreme environment, obviously, if you do it very rapidly, that's far more difficult. People can climb on Everest at the, in the, just below 30,000 feet if they do so very slowly, taking months to acclimate. But if they go up suddenly, they'll very rapidly pass out and, and, and die. Uh, and also uh, how well we are psychologically prepared for this. And this is something I really uh, can't stress in, the importance of enough is the ability to prepare ahead of time so that you're not stuck in a novel situation. It's something you've actually expected. Um, a key to this uh, ability to uh, go into an extreme environment is our ability to rapidly adapt, and this involves um, basically maintaining physiologic homeostasis to the degree the degree possible. Adaptation is allows us and has allowed us to survive, but there are situations where adaptations are maladaptive, um, and uh, one of those that you can think about is like. Uh, um, sickle cell disease allowed uh, people to live in sub-Saharan Africa in, in, in a malarial zones, uh, but now in a hypoxic environment, um, having sickle cell trait or disease is a very, very dangerous. So certain things that we adapt to may be beneficial in some scenario, but maybe uh, not beneficial in others. And again, the, in, the ability of individual very, uh, uh, individual, individual's tolerance of things is really incredible. And it's really not much, even though there are, you know, obviously as you get older or you're in worse fitness, uh, but there are very much, a lot of this is just the mental ability to tolerate the intolerable. Um, this, I like to do stuff outside, and this is a, a place out in West Texas, just north of Lake Amistad on the Rio Grande. And there are ancient uh, sites there that date back several thousand years before Christ that uh, these are some of the um, uh, rock art that's out there, uh, including the famous white shaman. Uh, and, and so um, uh, actually being able to go out and see how primitive people lived here in this, you know, in the, in the, in the same area that we live in with virtually nothing is pretty, uh, pretty cool. Um, some of the extreme environments will just kind of, you know, we'll talk about pr barometric pressure, gas composition, thermal environments, altered gravito inertial environments, behaviorally constrained environments. Uh, and then uh, things that are more internal is the, new, if you're deprived of certain nutrients, you can also have, uh, that can also be, uh, in essence, an extreme environment, and then also radiation. So all of these various factors have uh, come to uh, be uh, important in space because uh, they, um, they tie all these different environments. And you can imagine the compounding effect of having um, uh, extreme environments in any of those physical areas. So one of the things that we like to do in preparation for that and in testing equipment and procedures is to use analog environments. And, and I've been fortunate to do quite a few of these, uh, either um, you know, as an observer or as a participant. Um, 
to, to uh, get the experience of partial gravity uh, transiently, you can use parabolic flight. And this was actually done in uh, early in that in the uh, early 50s in propeller aircraft, um, and uh, they were able to get longer, longer periods of time. Uh, there's even a, a case where they used a supersonic uh, flight to get a longer period of parabolic flight. But in general, the amount of microgravity exposure or partial gravity that you can get is limited to maybe 25, 35 seconds. Um, the interesting thing is that because you can also do, you can do zero G, which is microgravity like we'd see in space, but you can also do partial gravity like lunar and uh, Martian gravities, which are one sixth and one third G, um, but it can only do it in very short bursts. We use undersea and, and uh, uh, underwater environments extensively because of the ability to neutrally uh, uh, create neutral buoyancy so that uh, even though you still are in gravity, you don't have the same uh, amount of uh, force on you from the gravity field because you balance it out by buoyancy. And this is one that NASA uses. They also use the 6 million gallon neutral buoyancy lab uh, for training. But the, uh, the one down in the uh, Keys, the NEMO, which is part of the Aquarius habitat, they're able to do a lot of testing of EVA tools because they can basically mimic uh, Mar Martian or uh, lunar gravity. Um, Hot Mars is a, a, a camp up in the uh, crater of uh, um, the uh, hot uh, crater up in Devon Island, which is in the 75 degrees north in the Canadian Arctic. And this is a marvelous area to test uh, various systems, but also the extreme, extreme environment itself and the austere nature of it. There's actually, there are two stations up there. The, there's the uh, Mars Society, Arctic, Re, Mars Arctic Research Station and the Mars Institute, hot and Mars uh, uh, station, but they're very close together. Um, and Jeff Sutton's been up there as, as have I, and we've done studies and, uh, and research, and it's an amazing uh, place. They're also uh, able to do, uh, find austere parts of the world, um, even the southwest of the United States, where they can test various rovers and uh, spacesuit operations in the, uh, the, the uh, desert research and technology studies. Um, one of the ones that we've just recently finished a big study in uh, through a, a cooperative program between NASA and the European Space Agency was in Cologne, Germany at the uh, uh, DLR NVHAB, which is an amazing facility because they can change atmospheric gas concentrations. Uh, they can change, go down to 11% um, oxygen. Uh, they can add a higher carbon dioxide levels up to, half, up to uh, 4%. Um, they can also do uh, very uh, robust bed rest studies. And we were, uh, um, uh, Baylor College of Medicine uh, was extensively involved in the artificial gravity ESA uh, um, analog study there where they were uh, 12 crew at a time went through 60 days of in, uh, head, head down tilt bed rest. And then uh, some got artificial gravity and some didn't. Um, there were two arms of that, so 24 test subjects, which is a huge number for this kind of thing. And uh, this was completed in 2019, just before the pandemic uh, started to close things down. And we were really fortunate that they, data coming out of this is, is amazing. So one of the things I always like to uh, give med students insight into is the importance of starting this preparation work early if you're interested in space medicine. Uh, one of the best ways you can do that is to get involved in wilderness medicine. And there's a lot of different uh, places that you can do that. I, I, I use the Wilderness Medi Medicine Society. There's other ones too. Um, and you, they'll go on expeditions and you train, train, and uh, do things in remote environments. It, it, it's virtually identical to space except for uh, some of the really austere things like the absence of pressure. But the remote isolation, the resource constraints, the communications uh, constraints, uh, um, the time pressures, time delays, all this kind of stuff. A key thing uh, that we do both in wilderness and space medicine is prepare uh, extensive preparation and training ahead of time um, because the goal is to prevent a problem 
but you also have to deal with what happens if it does exist. And uh, as one of my NASA colleagues always said, it's, it's all about people, equipment, procedures, and training. Um, I, I always like to review every time I do a class where, what we've done in space. We just finished uh, launching the uh, um, uh, Expedition 68 crew at the Crew 5 on the Axiom, or on the uh, SpaceX uh, last, just last Wednesday. Um, so just a week ago, uh, we had a four person crew. And the amazing thing about this is that it was the uh, um, two uh, women and two men and three different countries represented. Um, amazingly, in our spaceflight experience of 171 over, just imagine 171 uh, years of humans in space. Unfortunately, 90% of that has been in men, and we were rapidly changing that equation as we've taken more women in the astronaut corps. And also, uh, this last mission is a good example. 50% of the crew were women. Um, one of the things I like to point out is that we still have less than 600 people who've been to in, into low Earth orbit. Uh, and that's a, a, a pretty large number considering it's been over 60 plus years, but we're still trying to get data out of that. One thing is we start to go back to the moon and other uh, deep space endeavors where we don't have the protection of the uh, Van Allen belts um, is that we really have some serious work to get ahead. Uh, up to this point, and it was primarily because of the uh, uh, missions like um, the Apollo missions, but we have less than 30 people that have been to deep space. And of that time frame, it's, you know, uh, a little over half a year total. Um, and only 12 people have actually spent time on the moon um, for 25 person days. So Imagine as we spool up for Artemis, we've got to get start getting more experience in deep space and, and uh, planetary activities. Um, we have some uh, several records that have been out there. Most of them are in the hands of the Russians because they have they were flying long duration missions uh, more extensively as we pursued the lunar uh, exploration. But it, I like to think that if you wanted to go to Mars, you would need to go probably and a minimum of seven, 650, 700 days. And we already have had uh, people that have had accumulative exposures in that realm, but they're not very many, as you can see on the bottom there. Um, our organ systems have different uh, time constants for adaptation. Um, and as you can see here, um, in when you go from a, the environment of Earth uh, where you've spent your entire life and now you go into a, the microgravity environment, your body has to adapt to these new changes and, and each organ system has their own adaptive time constant. Um, what's interesting is when you come back to Earth uh, and you go from the adapted to space microgravity environment, the adaptive time constant is not the same recovery. In many cases, it's much longer. So that's something to be taken into consideration in the recovery and rehabilitation phase. The human uh, requires uh, various components for uh, its to, it to operate. You know, you can think of it as fuel and, and water and oxygen. And uh, in the process, it pro you produce, uh, you know, byproducts that have to be dealt with in environmental life control support control systems. Um, and this just shows you that we use this a lot in basically designing uh, systems for humans. Um, here's a cool shot of the Earth, which shows the bands of the atmosphere. And um, what that was, what, what I wanted to talk about next is that um, what, what is going to kill you the fastest is not often appreciated. Um, and this is something that we are now spending an extensive amount of work on, but in the absence of pressure, um, literally, you've got seconds, especially if it's complete vacuum, and as we'll get into. Believe it or not, people can uh, hold their breath uh, and survive for five minutes, 10 minutes. If you do pre-oxygenation and hyperventilation, there are folks that have held their breath close to 20 minutes, uh, which is pretty amazing. Without thermal protection, um, Literally, you can go uh, probably within minutes to hours 
you can go without water for a couple of days without food for most of us probably can stand several months without food and it'd be probably be beneficial and we know based on the fact that we've had people that have been in microgravity for over uh several years that gravity in it of itself won't kill you i will put the caveat though that it would likely not be benef uh, the absence of gravity would be very detrimental for fetal development Freeze and it's almost there. We go. Right I wanted to show you this tape. Holy shit! <laughs> that, that is. is. Every day. Oh yeah. my god! Water in it's a vacuum. Yeah. And so if you, right now you have boiling and frozen. The water the boiled time. at uh, at the vapor pressure point of three thousand feet, but when we go up higher, about double that altitude, um, it actually boils and freezes. And so this is probably why at very very high uh, altitudes or extreme low pressures that it's fatal um, because it causes massive damage to the lungs. And this is actually autopsy material on the right from the Columbia crew. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about space. Um, we face several threat in, uh, environments. Some in, are inherent to us as humans, you know, just general medical threats. And then some are compounded by the external environment, which actually are three different areas. One is the space environment. Uh, the other is the vehicle environment, and the other is what we do uh, in crew activities that can also affect um, uh, health and performance. So basically, we have all of these different threats, extrinsic and in intrinsic threats. One thing that's important to remember that even healthy, very pre-screened uh, uh, humans still have a risk of, uh, you know, uh, serious medical events, something that you would require a... Um, um, emergency room visit is 3% per person per year. And for a life-threatening kind of critical care and uh, intervention, it's, uh, um, uh, it's uh, a little bit higher. Uh, so, so for life-threatening events, it's about 3% per person per year. And for just any medical event that would require intervention, uh, you know, or medical some form of therapy at seven percent so you can imagine on a three-year mission with a seven person crew or or you know a six person crew that this is going to be there will likely be a medical event now i put this in there and at the very bottom is the link to it this is an interactive website that is uh the nasa significant incidents and close calls that was developed after the Columbia mishap, and it's basically every bad thing that's happened in space. And then also we have a few altitude chamber incidents and uh, uh, stratospheric aircraft breakups, things like that. The reds are loss of crew and vehicle and uh, yellow, uh, yellow or minor injuries and orange are significant injuries. But what you see here is the reds have all concentrated on ascent, and re-entry and landing. And that's because those are where high energy transition states occur. We'll get into that in a little, a little bit. So I'll, I'll briefly talk about the intrinsic threats that we've already seen in, in space mishaps where we've had to uh, come home early and evacuate from space uh, the, in, the, uh, in the Russian era because of their space long duration missions. They've had three that they actually terminated the mission for medical issues, and then three that they were in the process of uh, returning to Earth and the, and the medical issue uh, spontaneously resolved. We've had a lot of uh, fires and combustion events. Uh, we've had significant EVA in, uh, issues, including EVAs terminated for various reasons and crew injury. Um, and those medical events that I talked about that have ha had occurred during uh, space flight uh, basically encompass pretty much every uh, system you can imagine. The most important concern I, real, I feel is that we've had effects on performance. And um, it's one thing to be, uh, you know, uh, not feeling well. It's another to, uh, because of various things, uh, not be able to do a very important job, particularly when humans are involved in the activity. And that's invariably the case when there's Robotic operations, rendezvous and docking, spacewalks, uh, piloted reentry and landing, and this just shows you some of the spaceflight-related performance effects. Uh, astronauts um, 
um, often complain of this uh, space fog or space stupids. Um, and we have not yet teased that out, but um, I can tell you there have been a number of situations where crew, very highly trained and proficient crew, performed a switch throw error or a manual control task and caused a significant change to the mission architecture. Um, we've lo lost an incredible number of items on spacewalks, even though all those tools and cameras and stuff, which are very expensive, are supposed to be dual tethered as well. Um, and this was a classic example on uh, one of the uh, early uh, ISS missions where the crew was servicing their spacesuit and they put the boots uh, on backwards. Um, which is, you know, if you've ever uh, gone skiing and had a tight boot fit, you can imagine that that, that would not feel good. Um, behavioral health issues are uh, an area that I'm am amazed at the, the a level of uh, event, events. And I, I often say that, that abnormal behavior in an abnormal environment isn't necessarily abnormal, but we've had major behavioral events um, a payload specialist who was worried about his, his uh, failure of his, of his payload, uh, grief reaction, homicidal, suicidal thoughts, depression, uh, amazing stories. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about where the loss of, of, of life has occurred, and it's all been on the um, either ascent or reentry and landing. Um, and we, we have very good insight based on three uh, systems, the X-15, which flew almost 200 flights, the uh, um, shuttle, which flew 135 flights, and the Soyuz, which currently flies and has been flying since uh, 67 and has had 150 flights. But in general, for suborbital uh, vehicles, it's about a half a percent, like one in 200 uh, loss of crew. For the orbital flights in, a, in the shuttle, it was one in 62, and in the Soyuz, it's one in 75. So what that is, is that means that, you know, that it's at best, uh, you know, one in 200 for a suborbital and one in 100 for orbital. Um, our first space mishap was Mike Adams, and it was a human factors mishap. I won't go into all the details, but they'll be available. But um, the, this uh, vehicle um, came in sideways because the uh, pilot was distracted. He didn't set his uh, attitude indicator right. He didn't realize he was coming in sideways. He went into a flat spin and the vehicle uh, broke apart. Um, the sh a shuttle uh, launched uh, the 25th shuttle flight of uh, Challenger STS-51L uh, launched on um, January of uh, um, 86, and as you can see with that arrow is pointing out a smoke plume is coming out of the solid rocket motor because the launch was on such a cold day and they knew that and, and there was quite a bit of uh, um, uh, concern that by engineers that we shouldn't launch. But anyway, as they launched the vehicle, uh, uh, that leak um, caused the vehicle to break apart. Um, this was the vehicle breaking apart, and in the in that uh, the video footage, you can actually see the crew module, uh, which is broken apart and is intact, and the crew are still alive in there. They're unconscious from exposure to about uh, fifty thousand feet, so they're hypoxic, but they're not dead. And as a result of this, um, um, the after the challenger mishap they they said we need to have an ability to escape out of a breakup such as this because the crew were alive they, they had several had activated their air packs which were meant for smoke and wasn't adequate for sur survival and they obviously had no parachutes so they developed this system that came after the challenger and all the shuttle crews after uh challenger and 86 used this a bailout system um, so, uh, another crew was lost in, uh, during, uh, reentry, um, the Soyuz 11 crew, this was in 71 and the crew basically, um, they, they made a decision that they could fly two crew with spacesuits or three without, and they decided, cause they wanted to set a record. They weren't going to use uh, a pressure suit. 
During the uh, reentry, the vehicles have to pyrotechnically separate. The stutter occurred, and the ve uh, vehicle started to depressurize. Well, the the isolation valve on that uh, equalization valve required a manually turn, like a, a stem valve, like you have in a garden hose, you know. And it took multiple turns, and as a result of that, the crew perished before they could get that isolation valve closed. As a result of uh, an opportunity we had. Um, and this was the uh, re recovery forces uh, uh, trying to resuscitate them. Uh, we had access to uh, space flown capsules in the era after that Soyuz 11 mishap. And uh, this was a, a program that NSBRI sponsored where the, we had engineers that basically took apart these capsules and analyzed them. And so this is the anal ana analysis of the uh, isolation valve afterwards instead of having to turn a stem valve multiple times, all you had to do was push this little um, plunger and that would instantly shut off the isolation valve. So we learned from you know, a, a fatal event you know, that you have to be able to quickly uh, turn off an equalization valve with the isolation valve with just a little push of a hand. That was a really cool project that uh, uh, Dr. Sutton set up when he was uh, running NSBRI. So here's the launch of uh, Columbia in uh, January of uh, 2003. A piece of foam has come off the uh, external tank and punched a hole in the wing that size it. Probably you could put your head through. And on reentry, that uh, damaged wing resulted in the structural breakup of the uh, vehicle. Um, and these are, this was a camera footage from a uh, infrared camera from an Apache helicopter that showed the crew module there, which was debris item 21. And you can see it very rapidly decelerating, but we could tell from these camera images where the vehicle, uh, how high it was and how fast it was going. Um, the crew was alive for quite a long time after the vehicles bro initially broke apart. Um, for at least uh, um, over 30 seconds. Um, but then the vehicle started to rapidly uh, break apart and they, and they basically had multiple types of injuries. But the thing that got to them very, at the very beginning was they were unconscious from hypoxia and then the exposure to vacuum um, caused that kind of lung damage that you saw in that previous slide. Um, the, the bottom line is we learned a lot about things that didn't work well. The inertial reels, you know, like you have in your car, didn't lock. They were wearing a helmet that was uh, non-conformal, so their head was moving around inside, not like a motorcycle helmet. And basically, the little protuberances inside the helmet itself busted their neck, uh, their their um, uh, their skulls, and the neck ring broke their necks. Um, so the, basically, the system that was set up for Challenger, uh, because it was not totally adequate, it uh, didn't work. Um, Analysis was done uh, by uh, Jim Bajan a couple of years ago of what the shuttle risk really was. And as you can see here in the early shuttle program, it was one in 10. That's like, like a, I mean, you know, a couple of coin tosses. As it improved in the, after the Challenger mishap, it went up to one in 30, one in 38, one in, in 40. And then with the improvements throughout the rest of the program, it went up to one in uh, 90. And ironically, um, if you look at what is the risk compared to flying a shuttle or a spacecraft to uh, a other aerospace operations, it's, uh, we'll, we'll get into that in a second. This is a chart that's in a, a, a book, uh, uh, Principles of Clinical Medicine for Spaceflight. And it shows the human fatality flight envelope with airspeed on the bottom x-axis in Mach number and altitude on the y-axis. And the little red dots are where people have died. Uh, we have died, we have two uh, fatalities in the uh, uh, balloon test program. Uh, we have Spaceship Two here uh, at Mach 1 and about 50,000 feet. We have SR-71, we had two breakups there. We have a data from the Challenger broke up only at about 50,000 feet and had just gone through uh, Mach 1. So it was uh, supersonic, but just barely. And then way over in the corner here, we have uh, Challenge or uh, Columbia. 
Um, the interesting thing is that what's really dangerous is the uh, dynamic pressure, which is the pounds per square foot. Uh, and the, the, the challenge of uh, the Columbia broke up at about 400 pounds per square foot dynamic energy, which is actually uh, where the uh, SR-71 dynamic pressure was. And in this mishap, the two uh, SR-71 mishaps, three of the crews survived. And here's, here's, here's the survival envelope. So anyway, we're going to have to get going here. Anyway, the bottom line is that space flight is about what combat uh, U.S. bomber crew in Europe had in World War II, better than about one in 100. Ironically, this was a safety office poster at NASA. Uh, I was involved in the Columbia crew survival investigation. And this just shows us pictures of, of us redo, uh, putting together uh, what the crew was doing, what switch throws they made. They actually were trying to restart the uh, uh, auxiliary power units. As a result of that experience, I was involved in these high altitude uh, free fall escape programs, uh, both uh, uh, Felix's uh, jump, which was uh, in two days, it'll be the 10th anniversary or three days, it'll be the 10th anniversary. And in a week and week and a half or so, it'll be the eighth anniversary for Alan Eustace's jumps. Both of these broke the sound barrier and in a regime of altitude that was uh, close to where the Columbia broke up. And I'll just go through that some of the le uh, lessons. First of all, we did a lot of analog testing. You can do it in a vertical wind tunnel. It's really safe. You get an idea of what the uh, pressure suit constraints are. You can do low altitude jumps out of a helicopter. But once you start testing uh, at higher altitude, the suit has to be inflated. I put this slide in to show this was the early parachute design, and these handles um, are very easy to pull. And but the problem is they couldn't, uh, they weren't recognizable by Felix. And he, one of the low altitude jumps, he pulled the wrong handle and actually cut away his parachute. And both parachutes had cutaway handles for a variety of reasons. So um, uh, we ended up using color coded and tactilely different handles. Pretty common thing, you know, you got to, you know, back up, know what you're doing when you pull it. And here, and here was a, a, a jump from 30,000 feet with the suit inflated. Um, at the time Felix did his jump, in, starting in 29, 2009, four people had tried this in the 60s and two had died. So it was a, you know, a coin toss of who lived and who died. And um, in addition to the complexity of the system and the close calls and training, there was a period of about a year that Felix had some serious issues uh, psychologically that we had to uh, deal with. Um, from our standpoint, the primary threats um, that we'll focus on were the stratospheric threats of the um, low pressure. Two of the, those two fatalities in the, in the 60s were from a uh, suit pressure failure. Uh, pressure suit uh, compromise. And then fl the flat spin, um, the ascent injury uh, and the landing injuries are something you face in any balloon flight, but the ones that we were focusing on were the upper atmospheric threats. And um, it was a wonderful um, team that we pulled together uh, that many of them came from residency. Uh, Alex Garbino was a med student at the time. Uh, and I'm still working with him on projects. In fact, we leave tomorrow for a jump project out in California. Uh, but every one of these folks um, was able to take uh, ownership of a part of those threats. And um, each of them were first authors, which is kind of cool. We had to test and we came up with a, 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 a way to treat ebulism if we had that exposure based on a variety of different consultants inputs. And we came up with a high frequency percussive ventilator, which we flew uh, on both the air assets and ground recovery forces for both the Rebels, Stratus, and Stratic space dive, and also for subsequent uh, vacuum chamber tests that we're involved with. Um, and here you can see uh, the, the second jump, which was Alan Eustace's, got to 100, almost 136,000 feet. Here he is with his suit and our team. Uh, and Anil Menon was one of the folks on here. Uh, Laura uh, Galmides was uh, one of the med students on it. It was a really great team. Um, uh, Anil 
went to SpaceX as their first flight surgeon and became, uh, and he's now a NASA astronaut candidate. Um, but what's really cool was 80 years before Alan's jump on the cover of this magazine, Science and Mechanics, um, there was a guy going up in a balloon in a pressure suit. And 80 years later, we turned science fiction into science fact. Kind of cool. So we'll talk about this issue about exposure to vacuum. Um, if you remember your pulmonary gas equation at 47 millimeters of mercury, that's the vapor pressure of water. And that's where water goes from a liquid to a gas at body temperature. And that is at about a 63,000 foot uh, altitude. It's not a specific line that you go over one foot and you're, it's a band really. But what we've started to um, uh, surmise is that uh, at about twice that altitude, even though 63,000 is the considered the physiologic limit of space, that at about twice the altitude, we start to see water go um, from a liquid and exist in three states at simultaneously, the gas and solid, as well as the liquid. And um, just as a comparison um, at the uh, Armstrong's line is about one PSI and the triple point is about 0.1 PSI. And at the end of the day, that's what happens when you're exposed to vacuum. Uh, a tray of water turns into space ice, which is a kind of cool way to make a cocktail. We've done analyses on uh, all of the human exposures to vacuum. Uh, and we're now doing this study out in uh, Midland. Uh, they're a vacuum chamber complex. The reason we're using it is it can go really, really high. It can go over 200,000 feet. So this was a study that was done over several years of in, in, uh, uh, starting in the 20, uh, early 2015 timeframe. And now we did, we did our, our first animal run in 2021. 20, uh, uh, um, and this is some quick pictures comparing the profiles that we were wanting to target versus what we were getting. And the fatality, interestingly enough, it seems like the fatalities are definitely above um, Armstrong's line, whereas the green ones, which were survived but euthanized, uh, were able uh, just below that um, uh, triple point line. So Armstrong's line is not as fatal, it seems to be, as the, as the triple point. And this is work that Alex Garbino has put together. Basically, we're attempting to do a whole new classification of ebulism, uh, which includes whether there's components of DCS and barotrauma uh, or pure ebulism alone. This is a list of references. The, this little reference down here, Roth's, uh, was the description of the, the JSC exposure, an excellent publication that we actually put in the vacuum chamber. Um, and also have an article I've written, or a book chapter I've written with Andy Pelmanis, who's the world's expert in altitude decompression sickness. And I have these electronically. I have, I have most of these electronically, if you're interested. Okay, sorry. Um, I'm going to speed through suit chamber testing. That's one of the th uh, analogs that we used extensively in Red Bull and in the uh, uh, Stratic Space Dive. I was also involved with our team on the first suited run of a human with the SpaceX suit. It was classified at the time, but, but because of we did this, uh, they got the NASA contract. We've done extensive spacesuit testing actually here in our facility at NSBRI. Uh, as you can see here, uh, we've had summer interns uh, when Excalibur was working that were actually do interface testing. When we did the physiologic monitor for Red Bull Stratus, we tested it in the Sokol suit. And here you can see Alex uh, suiting up his wife, who was the test subject. Um, this is just some other tests, uh, centrifuge testing, uh, some other tests for uh, UTMB's aerospace students. Uh, and also just recently we did one for uh, CSM students. And that was a pretty cool event, wasn't it, Jeff? Uh, so anyway, just the kind of compilation of lessons learned here is uh, you really have to kind of break out the threats into the most specific thing you can. Uh, what do they involve? The vehicle, the environment, the mission profile, and what kind of failures you anticipate. We always uh, say, you know, train like you fly and fly like you train in uh, space flight and, and, and in aviation. Um, the more data you can collect in these different environmental conditions in analog in particular, 
gives you insight into where how close you are to a physiologic stress point. And we we could tell from some of our data that um, in Felix's case, there was a, 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 not just a physical stress, but an anxiety component to it that we had to address. Um, we had a very extensive contingency plans for virtually every kind of thing. This tiered approach is really important. You know, you want to prevent it at all costs, mitigate it if it happens, or if it gets into a full-blown condition, manage it uh, accordingly. So this tiered uh, defense in depth is really important. Uh, system safety throughout everything. Humans have to inter interact with um, systems, and those systems uh, have failure modes. But more importantly, if, this, if the human does the wrong thing and the failure is compounded, then that makes it worse. And uh, astronauts uh, like Coop Gibson will always say, whatever you do, don't make the situation worse. We extensively learn from the lessons of others. We analyzed every, uh, all of those uh, preceding events that happened in other parachute jumps, the failure modes and how we would deal with it. And NASA now has this significant incidents chart, which goes in, if you click on any of those little boxes, it will show up uh, all of this, the source material on it. Um, in general, uh, the uh, risks that we currently face in spaceflight have been on ascent, uh, reentry and landing, the high energy transition states. Uh, but we have the potential for uh, more serious problems when we fly longer and longer missions where now we have intrinsic medical events that will now start to rear their ugly head. Um, if you look at a suborbital system, it doesn't have the same, it's, a, it's probably 10 times less energy uh, that it has to deal with. And so the, uh, from the 200 plus, or the just shy of 200 flights, it's about half a percent loss rate. For the uh, orbital systems, uh, both the wing vehicle and the blunt capsule, it's about, you know, it's in the um, just shy of one in a hundred. Um, it's interesting, SpaceX, uh, which I do work for a company that does space rescue for SpaceX, that um, for the um, missions that are currently launched, they figure the loss rate is about one in 300. Um, so we remember the hazards of the space environment, of, of space flight include the space environment, vehicle environment, and mission architecture. The real concern is how does it affect performance? Uh, medical events have resulted, have occurred in space and resulted in early mission termination and, er, and human errors have contributed to events that have affected uh, crew health and performance. Here's my contact info. Here's some reference material. These are some really good books. I have this human physiology in extreme environments electronically. I have a hard copy of these, uh, uh, these books, really cool books. This book uh, is a NASA book. Uh, it's a great coffee table book, but I also have that electronically if anybody's interested. It's the history of pressure suits from very early on till the present day. And then these are some books that were related to the high altitude uh, freefall programs. Um, Come Up and Get Me was Joe Kittinger's book. And then The Wild Black Yonder, which is very engineering centric, talked about all of our close calls. So with that, I'll end and hopefully we have time for a few questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Clark. That was fabulous. A tour de force. And uh, to the students, you know, I wish one day that you'll be able to deliver lectures like this. <laughs> Dr. Clark really has a encyclopedic knowledge and, you know, phenomenal experience and conveys complex information in a, in a very straightforward and comprehensible way. I'm sure you have some questions, so please don't be bashful. We've got a couple of minutes, eight minutes or so. So please, please ask questions. Yeah, and just remember, if you ask a tough one, I'm going to ask tougher ones back on the quiz. So. <laughs> oh, is there a quiz? Jimmy, is yeah. there a quiz? Yeah, there is a quiz. Sorry to okay. say. Well, I, okay. So, so my so, idea. I'm just doing what I'm told. Does it? Does anybody have a question or two before the quiz? In a silent group. Okay, Jimmy, why don't you? Why don't you uh, launch the quiz and sure. email folks can think about questions. 
All right, here's question number one. Critical variables for human survival include If I do it, does it I bring the curve up? <laughs> well, as long as you get it right. <laughs> right. Five more seconds. I tell you what, we can discuss it if people have questions on the questions. I think first one, we got a pretty unanimous response. Hey, thank goodness. <laughs> some are, some are going to be challenging, I can tell. All right. So question number two, spacecraft mishaps result in fatalities have occurred. Five more seconds. Okay. Thank you, Rowan. Sharing results with 15 responses. John, do you see that? Yeah. So the ascent breakup was uh, the challenger mishap. So, um, I mean, yeah, I, I guess I could kind of see how you would say that because really, everything ends when you hit the earth, you know, so, um, but if, if anybody has any comments, I'd be glad to go into that. It's considered an ascent breakup because that's when it happened or when the proximal event happened. If they had had a bailout system, they might've been able to survive. Okay, we'll load number th question number three. Risk of fatality in human space flight is approximately that of? Five more seconds to respond. Okay, thank you. Sharing results. With 16 responses. I wish it was as good as a come. I, I fly a, um, aircraft like uh, light planes, um, and our loss rate's about one in a hundred. I mean, one in a hundred thousand. Um, and combat losses are about uh, tenfold more uh, fatal than. Uh, military flying, which is about one in a hundred thousand, same as uh, same as um, non-commercial flying. So, the, what the point of here is that um, space flight risk is actually pretty risky. Um, you know, so hopefully that will I can, that that's explained. All right, thanks, John. Let's go on to question number four. The hazards of spaceflight include five more seconds to respond. Okay, ending poll. Your responses, John. Oh, great. Okay, well, I got we. I must. I got. I got. I guess I got that point across. This next one will be really hard. All right, here it is. Question number five. What is the proper order from most lethal to least serious when deprived of these parameters? Five more seconds. Okay, ending poll. All right, John, I had 14 responses here. 
Yeah, this was a hard one because it was it, you, you have to get it exactly right. Uh, the the take home point is that gravity, lack of gravity, isn't going to kill you. Uh, so you know the only right answer is what pressure is the is the most uh, the absence of pressure is the most uh, threatening and the, the least threatening is the absence of gravity. Yeah, and I'd be happy to entertain any questions if you have any. Yeah, that's the last question. Quiz question. Awesome. And if you if anybody is interested in electronic, I've got electronic versions of a lot of the publications. If you're interested in in this or some of the other aspects of it. Yeah, that's really great. And uh, thank you for sharing so many of the, the references and making them available. And again, uh, for the students, John is really a go-to person. He's uh, very approachable. If you think of any questions after the lecture, uh, feel free to reach out to him. Uh, he really loves uh, teaching. Um, okay, well, last- My goal is to pass the torch. Yeah. Yeah, that's really great. Uh, last last call for questions. Okay, again, uh, shy group, but uh, I hope that you enjoyed today's talk. Don't forget to do your attestation, and we'll see you all next week. Thanks again, Dr. Clark. And yeah, thank you all. Okay, take care. Bye for now. See ya, everyone.